Welcome to this third in, the, in a three-part series on DNA concepts for genealogy, specifically focused on Y-DNA. My name is Dave Vance. Uh, as I've said in the first two videos, I'm the project administrator for the Vance Surname Project. I'm a co-administrator for the L513 Haplogroup Project, and I've created uh, a few tools for Y-DNA. I've been involved in genealogy for nearly 40 years, and um, I've been involved in Y-DNA studies since 2005. So this third part, if you've lasted with me so far through the first uh, two videos, you know that I started out pretty high level, talked about the value of Y-DNA for genealogy. Then in the second video, I crashed down into what I called the murky depths of Y-DNA itself, talked about the genetics, talked about what you get in the reports that you'll eventually use for DNA. This third video, I'm going to try to bridge the two. So I'm going to show you how you take what you got in a Y-DNA test and apply it to genealogy, apply it to uh, your knowledge of what you have to extend that in order to get additional information, in order to connect with your matches and get information from them, and put it all together to extend your genealogy. So the steps that I'm going to talk about here, the steps in analyzing your results, most people start with the first two. So you look over your results when you first get a Y-DNA test. You understand what they're telling you. You read the help information. You see the reports. You see the matches then. You look at them over. Sometimes you have matches of your own surname. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have no matches at all. Sometimes you have thousands of matches. So everything depends on what test you took. Everything depends on what your DNA reveals and how close other people are to your haplogroup uh, and your area of the database. Uh, as we talked about in the second video, a lot of the testers are Euro of European or origin, so uh, European origin people have a natural advantage in finding matches in the database, but we need more testers from other places, from other parts of the world to extend the haplotree and extend our knowledge of the ancestry of man, of men in this case, but specifically. Um, so we need more testers from other places other than Europe, and I would encourage um, everyone to build your own area of the haplotree, because that'll help not only your own genealogy, but the others who come after you. Now then, if you can transfer results to other databases, that would be useful. Um, I know Family Tree DNA does accept some results transferred in, mostly autosomal. Um, but if you take a Y-DNA test and want to compare to people who have taken uh, the test from other companies, uh, there's a company called Y-Full, which does charge, I believe it's $49 for you to combine your data uh, into their database, but um, they offer the ability to compare your data to uh, people outside of the testing company that you tested with. So that can be very useful. I will say, and I'll say this several times, when you decide to share your data, you'll get a lot of advice for and against. It is fairly common for people to share data, and the major companies, and certainly the ones that I talk about here in this video, um, are uh, reputable and do uh, safeguard your information. However, sharing of information is always an added risk. You need to be comfortable with those risks yourself. So. I'll say, do some research, make sure that you're comfortable with sharing before you do. Just be aware that a lot of other people do and manage to do that successfully and use it successfully in their own research. Now, if you've tested with Family Tree DNA, it's relatively simple to join surname and haplogroups, or sometimes they're also geographical projects. Um, and uh, you do that in order to get assigned to subgroups. I'll I'll talk a lot more about the value of these projects in a little bit. Um, but of course, if you didn't test with Family Tree DNA, it's not as easy to automatically join those projects and get your data analyzed. So if you do find a surname, haplogroup, or geographical project that you think would be useful, you can always contact the admins. They're always listed. Their emails are always given. You can always contact them and see if they'll analyze your data for you, help you analyze it at least. Uh, assign you to a subgroup virtually because they won't have your data in the project that they can assign it automatically or in the system. 
So if you can get them to at least tell you what subgroup you match most closely to, you can start to analyze your data and that subgroup's data together, even if you can't physically see your data sitting side by side with theirs. So there's ways to do it, even if you haven't tested with family tree DNA. Uh, but this is a very useful aspect of family tree DNA. They not only have a large database of Y-DNA, but they also have these projects which allow you to coordinate with matches much easier than you otherwise could. And the last thing is once you've done that, you've been assigned to a subgroup, You've got either a family group that you're connected to or a group that's connected back before the time of surnames, so they're related but aren't what we usually think of as traditionally in, geneal in uh, genealogical times. You want to map out those subgroups. This gets back to the lineages that I was talking about in the first video. Uh, you want to start mapping those connections you have even before any of your combined genealogies. But if you collect the member's genealogy and analyze this group as a whole, you start to see patterns, you start to see common sources of migration, you start to put together the knowledge that each of these lines have, and it helps you develop theories of their origins, of their connections, even possibly of names of ancestors, if you can match them up to records, or if you had a choice, perhaps, of, of uh, several documented lines that you might have connected to, you can... Uh, have clues that give you that would point to one of those lines. You may or may not find proof, but you can develop theories and avenues of further research. So that's the steps that I'll be going through in terms of what you do with your Y-DNA results. So if I talk about what you get in your Y-DNA results, let's start here. And I showed this picture in the second video. But you start with essentially four things, depending on whether you took an STR test or a SNP test. If you didn't test with family tree DNA, your pictures, your results won't look exactly like this. You'll get similar types of information, and I would certainly suggest you start by reading the company's help information, reading their descriptions of your results, reading what they suggest you use those for, and follow their guidelines first to get as much out of your results as you can. But I will say all the major companies are relatively basic in what they offer in terms of genealogy value. They're mostly uh, testing companies, not genealogy companies. So they usually stop pretty quickly in terms of explaining the genealogical value of your test. They stop at the genetic results, and you need to make the bridge and the leap forward, and that's really what we're talking about here. But what you get essentially is either an STR or a SNP-based match list. In this case, I've taken an example from the STRs, so it shows the genetic distance. If this were a SNP test, you'd see uh, perhaps non-matching variants, non-matching SNPs between you and your matches. The format is a little different, but the idea is these should be, and we talked about this some in the, in the second video, these should be your closest matches in that company's database. You'll also usually get either a confirmed or a predicted haplogroup. This would be your terminal haplogroup, although the word terminal here is a bit of a misnomer because especially if it's predicted, it may be fairly high level. So it's not the most recent SNP that's occurred on your branch. It's just the most recent SNP that they can estimate from your results. So again, if you've taken an in-depth an in SNP test like a, a big Y, you'll get a very detailed uh, confirmed haplogroup here. Otherwise, it's relatively high level, and we talked about that in the second video. You'll get a lot of raw data, both STR and SNP based, depending on what test you took. Again, my contention is the raw data doesn't do you a whole lot of good until you start comparing yourself against other people. Uh, even the SNPs that you have, it will tell you your haplogroup, it will tell you your branch. But from a genealogical standpoint, you don't get a lot of value in that until you start to understand how that helps you match your branch against other people and tell you what your combined genealogy looks like. And then often if you do have SNP results, they'll put you on their version of a haplotree. They'll show you where you fall in relation to other men. Uh, it's useful to understand the formats. I won't go into the company's formatting here very uh, in very much detail, but the idea is you see yourself on a tree against other people. You get a sense from the number of SNPs how far back your common ancestors are, and you can connect yourself either to a lineage or deep ancestry, if you remember my terminology from the first video. So that's 
generally what you get in your results um, from any company. And as I said, the format of the reports do vary. So what do you do with this? Well, the first thing you do is what we've talked about already, is you look this over and you see what your matches tell you. So um, we talked about convergence. We talked about how STRs can sometimes show you matches that are not really closely related to you um, by the chance migration of certain, um, of certain STRs to look more like the patterns that you have. Um, that's a real problem at 37 markers or below, less so, but not completely gone away at 67 or 111 markers. SNP testing eliminates that particular problem, but SNPs are not always reliable. You have to be a little careful if the company puts them on their haplet tree, that usually means they've decided that they are reliable, but you will probably have a lot of uh, private variants, as they're called, uh, SNPs that have only occurred on the branch that you sit on after your last known common ancestor on that haplet tree. And so those are a question mark. If you share them with other people on that branch, you have to figure out if those are good to use for branching or not. And that can be a choice. Uh, sometimes you make the choice and a third tester comes along and you find out the SNP was not reliable. But those are the kinds of things that the testing company doesn't often help you with you may need to get additional help in order to find that out. <clears throat> but your match list, at least in the start, look for surnames, earliest ancestors that you recognize, uh, because they will also usually list what they know of in terms of their own earliest ancestor. Locations, maybe even, if your ancestors came from a particular part of the world, look for other ancestors who do as well, and start contacting matches that look like they have a connection to you. There is, if you're doing a test with family tree DNA, there's something called the TIP tool, which estimates the common ancestor, uh, the age back to the common ancestor that you share with any match. It is not terribly precise, but it may give you an indication at least of whether or not the common ancestor is likely to be in a time frame that you care about. And that depends on your questions, of course. If you're only interested in breaking through a very close brick wall, if you don't know who your paternal grandfather was, for instance, and that's really the only question you're testing to find, if you find a match that appears to be connected in the tip tool back uh, in the times back when surnames were first adopted or even before, that's probably not, possibly, but probably not going to help identify your immediate paternal grandfather. It may help you with the surname, so you need to look at it potentially. But that's the kind of thing, if you use the tip tool, not to get a precise estimate of the common ancestor, but just to get an understanding of whether or not the ancestor is likely to be in a time frame that means something to you, that will help you prioritize your matches and see where the ones that will give you the most value by contacting them uh, are probably from. My suggestion, by the way, is not to use genetic distance itself for any of this. Genetic distance is not a reliable predictor of the age of your common ancestor. We talked about this in the second video. It's too vague. It just gives you a list to start with. So although you can usually treat, usually, not always, treat the order of genetic distance as a comparative relationship, so the ones with a smaller genetic distance should be closer to you, that's not a guarantee. And it also does not predict how close they are. For some people, the close genetic distances are very close, and some people, the close genetic distances are very far away. So be, be careful. My suggestion is not to use genetic distance for anything but the first wave or the first analysis of who's mostly connected to me, and then start using the tip tool and other tools that we'll talk about in order to get a better sense of when those people are connected. For your confirmed haplogroup or your predicted haplogroup, depending on what it is, Find this SNP, in this case it's FGC32081, uh, find that SNP on the company's haplot tree. A lot of the companies have a version of the haplot tree. If, if the company that you tested with doesn't have one, you can look on either Family Tree DNAs, which is probably the most complete at the moment because they have the most testers, or uh, YFOL has one, the ISOGG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, has a haplot tree as well. It tends to be the most restrictive because they have the most restrictive criteria for what to put on it. But you can look at any of those. And uh, 
if it's a predicted haplogroup, it's likely to be an old one. So it's likely to be there, but it's a 4,000, 10,000 something year old SNP. That may not help you with your uh, questions, but you can ask about this branch. This is likely to give you more deep ancestry information, where that SNP is thought to have originated, what um, old cultures have carried it. In some cases, um, very old SNPs have been found uh, in ancient digs in Europe or the British Isles in Ireland. Um, so people have started mapping where these SNPs migrated to, in what time frames. You can learn that kind of information. Whether or not that's meaningful to you is another question, but at least it gives you a little more information about the population level migration of your, uh, of your ancestry. Right now. Flipping over to the right-hand side of this chart, uh, as I said, your raw data is not likely to give you a lot of value just in analyzing it, it for itself. You'll learn that you have certain uh, mutations. You'll learn that your STRs have certain values. You'll learn that you have certain SNPs. But until you start comparing those to other people, that data in and of itself doesn't give you a lot of genealogical information. The SNPs, if you, if you did take a SNP test, the SNPs that you have, as I said, will put you on a haplotree somewhere. Mostly, uh, the company will show you at least a high-level version of this. In some cases, you have to do some additional research with your private variants or the private SNPs. Um, in some cases, if you take a very advanced SNP test, you'll just get a list of results, and you may have to go find a haplotree and plot yourself on this kind of a chart and see where you fall and see what other men have tested that fall into close haplogroups if the company that you tested with doesn't have a matching function of their own. So this will vary uh, by which company you have tested with quite a bit. But it not only gives you a place on the haplotree, it not only gives you the people that you're most connected with if you, the company that you tested with uh, does have uh, a fairly large uh, set of men who have tested and you can automatically get compared against them and find matches. And it also gives you a list of private variants that are only on your branch since later than the common ancestor that you share with your closest match, which is your private line. It's the one so far that only you have tested from. And that will give you an idea. SNPs do mutate on certain frequencies. It's not terribly... Uh, reliable as a predictor of age, but you can do it. We'll talk a little bit about age estimation uh, at the end of this video. I will not go into much detail on it here. Uh, it is a subject that you'll find a lot about uh, if, you, if you delve into some of the additional resources that I'll uh, talk about at the end of the video. So you can find out about it, you can estimate it, but bear in mind it is fairly vague. It's not very precise. In any case, th this this is the kind of information that will give you the, the additional knowledge that it will take in order to estimate those kinds of things. Now, a part of the reason that you join up with social media projects and other groups where there are experts who can help advise you on this is that you get a lot of tricks and tips from people in terms of how you analyze your matches and what you do. As a, for instance, I just listed four of them here, you'll get a lot more if you do ask questions uh, in the various uh, resources that I've put at the end of this video. But for instance, if you've taken a 111 STR test, you have no matches at that level. You can set the filter in the reports to drop you down to either 67 or 37. This is a family tree DNA example. And when you do that, you may see additional matches. Now, if those matches have tested themselves at a higher level, but you don't see them as a match at that level, that means they're not really as closely related to you as the lower level match report would suggest. So you can do a lot of analysis this way and find matches that may not match you at higher levels, but they haven't tested that far. So it's still important for you to pursue them. So the match reports are a little more complicated than you might see immediately. You'll get more value out of them if you play with the filters a little bit. Also, if you and a reported match don't have the same predicted haplogroup, that's not a showstopper. You may actually be connected. You may have the same terminal haplogroup, 
but your tests haven't reported the same prediction. I'll talk about how that works in a couple of slides. The third one is, if you only have a high-level predicted haplogroup, check and see whether your closest matches have a, have a higher-level test than yours. If they've tested, let's say, to 111, or they've taken a big Y, and you haven't taken that kind of a test, their haplogroup prediction may be more specific than yours, and that may be your more specific haplogroup as well. So you may be able to see what your predicted haplogroup is at a more detailed level than the one you got out of your own test. You have to double check that, but it is a good way to estimate where you will end up as a terminal haplogroup at the end of the branch that's on the haplotree when you didn't even get that information out of your own test. And one that's specific to SNP testing, the match report that you get from a big Y on SNPs specifically is set very tight. You only see very close matches from that. Now, they may change that in time. If they, ha if they have, then this particular tip won't mean as much. But you can go to the STR matches and see matches a little further out than, than the SNP report will tell you in a big Y. And that'll give you sort of a second level of matching that you can compare yourself against. So you can set a filter there to only show the STR matches who have also taken a big Y. And that allows you usually to see more matches than the big Y SNP-based report shows you in itself. Now, yeah. one thing that's important to know about matches is if you want to get the most value out of them, you really need them at all levels. So if you remember this chart from the first video, I'm talking a lot about the three periods of ancestry that YDNA helps with. Uh, at the lowest level in the genealogy period, you want matches in this period because you want to identify earlier named ancestors that you might connect with. So, for instance, here, if your genealogy knowledge is in this box, that's as far as you've gone with traditional research, you want a match here that will be able to tell you that your uh, earlier ancestors might be these people here. So you can break through a brick wall, but usually only if you have a match in this time period. In the same way, if you're looking for additional information, information that may even be before the time of surnames, or you want to get more information about the origin of your surname or where your ancestors came from in the world, etc., you may not be able to name the ancestors. This may be in the time of what I'm calling lineages. But you want to be able to get matches in this time frame in order to study it. If you only get very close matches, you won't have a basis for determining what has happened in this time period. In the deep ancestry time period, you usually don't need specific matches because there usually have been enough matches that are this uh, far apart from you that they've already been able to tell a lot about the haplotree in this area. And individual matches don't necessarily add to a population level knowledge of where your ancestry comes from. But Obviously, if you test and you're from a lineage that has not been well tested, and no one else that's related to you within 10,000 years has matched in the database, or has even tested in the database, you won't get a lot of deep ancestry information either uh, for the last, let's say, 10,000 years, because you're the only example of that line that has been found so far. So you will define your own branch of the haplotree, but it won't be able to tell you a whole lot about where that's been, what's happened, uh, any earlier than your own genealogy knowledge. So people do find gaps sometimes because they have genealogy knowledge, they connect up at a deep ancestry level thousands or tens of thousands of years ago, and there's nothing in between for them to learn because there are no matches. That can happen. So what happens if you have no matches? The simple answer, as I said, is that YDNA can tell you about your deep ancestry, but doesn't give you much information about your genealogy or even your lineages. So what do you do in that case? Well, the first answer is get more matches. That's easy to say, not always easy in practice. You want to go out and convince men to test who are likely to match you. So you want to go to the region that you think your earliest ancestor came from, look for people of your surname if uh, it's within the time that you're likely to find someone there that descends from the same uh, group as you, from the same family as you. 
um, or just get men to test in general to see if someone matches. That's more of a scattershot approach, but it's been successful for some people in terms of finding people that they didn't even know were related to them. If if this if it's within the last let's say five to nine generations, if this is where you're trying to get more matches, you can convince uh, you you can find people to convince to test by using autosomal DNA. So you take an autosomal DNA test, you connect up with a man who uh, has a surname that you're interested, or even just a man who's out at let's say a third cousin or a fourth cousin level at a time frame where you don't know who your common ancestor would be there before your own genealogy knowledge. And you, uh, and you convince them to test, and that provides you a match and helps you analyze that time frame. So that's one way to find more matches, to target more matches, without knowing those people beforehand. Now, my point here is there have been, they're, they're not commercially available yet, but there has been some progress in finding creative sources of matches, hair samples. Um, people have even um, gone and gotten the permission to dig up ancient ancestors in order to test them uh, to be able to tell what Y-DNA line they carried and get the mutations that will help them analyze them as a match. It's not common yet. I don't know if it will be. That gets into a lot of privacy and other uh, questions that are not going to be easily resolved. But if hair samples, for instance, became... Uh, useful for DNA research, or in some cases they've been able to pull DNA off of a stamp that was perhaps put on the envelope of a will for an old ancestor, etc. Those are very uh, exciting possibilities in terms of gathering additional information for people that will end up being a match to you, even if they're not currently alive and, and they aren't uh, current descendants that you can compare against. You can still compare your DNA against th theirs and learn something, especially if you have a common ancestor that's before the time of your own genealogy research. So that's open to possibility. It's not a reality today yet, though. If you have taken an exploratory SNP test, this is only for the people that have, uh, that have uh, been able to take uh, an NGS or a WGS test, as we talked about before, you can submit your test results to YFL to compare. We've talked about YFL before, and I made the point explicitly here. Uh, you will hear that sharing Y-DNA is dangerous, and nobody can predict the future as to what will happen with our DNA information on file. However, Especially with Y-DNA, now autosomal is a little bit different because there is uh, genetic and medical information in autosomal DNA tests that's not in a Y-DNA test. Most of the results from a Y-DNA test can't be used for medical purposes, can't be used for identification purposes, and a lot of the fears that people have about DNA testing are not founded in Y-DNA. However, um, I'm not saying that it's fine to leave all of your information available freely on the internet for everyone to download either, especially because no one can predict the future. So my real point here is you'll get a variety of uh, advice on this um, when you talk to people and get advice from them. I, I would say you need to be comfortable with whatever level of sharing you will do. I share my data relatively freely. I investigate the companies beforehand. I only share it with the ones that I feel have a reputable position in the industry, and all of the all of the companies that I talk about in these three videos do. Um, so I don't have an issue with sharing my data in sources or in places that are going to give me value for my genealogy, but you need to make that choice for yourself. So I would heartily recommend doing some research before you start sharing, but realize that sharing is pretty common. People do it all the time, and they get value out of it. So that's my advice on that. The third option, I'm sorry to say, is some people are just waiting for matches to show up. You've exhausted the other options. You're waiting for your area of the haplotree to be fleshed out. You're waiting for other people who descend from the same common ancestors to be tested. In some cases, this is a general statement that they're waiting for any match. And in some cases, they're just waiting for a match to show up in the right time frames to give them value about those questions they've been able to answer, let's say, all the genealogy questions they had, all the deep ancestry questions they had, but they haven't been able to answer uh, the information that allows them to put a lineage together to tell the origins of their surname, let's say, or some other question that they might have had there. So this definitely depends on your case. I can't answer it for the general 
case because it's it's highly variable. But the only way to find out is to test. Now, on the other hand, if you do have matches, your next step is really to join a surname haplogroup group or geographic project. This is also a good idea if you don't have matches or if you have very few, because you may be able to find people that are related to you that are just outside the match limits. So this isn't restricted to people who only have matches, but it's particularly useful if you do. What does this give you? It gives you access to, uh, to project administrators, first of all, who hopefully have expertise not only in Y-DNA analysis in general, but in the specific surnames or haplogroups or areas of the haplotree or even geographies that you're interested in pursuing. So they'll be able to give you very tailored expertise and advice on uh, how to analyze your matches and so on. They also give you the ability to see the actual STR data if you're doing that kind of research. Um, they'll, instead of just genetic distance, they'll be able to, uh, you, you can see the actual STR data for your matches and see where you compare against on individual markers. It allows you to go and find matches uh, beyond your usual match report limits, so you can see people that may be related back a little bit further than that. Whether or not that helps you with questions is another matter, but having matches in general is a good thing. And if the administrators are splitting up their project into subgroups, they'll be able to assign you into a subgroup that's more likely to be closely related. Now, in surname projects, these could be completely different haplogroups. If your surname is Smith, you may have a completely different origin than other Smiths. But they'll find anyone who has tested and who has joined the group who comes from your same origins, and they'll group you into that subgroup. So you can then have a group of matches and perhaps people who are beyond the, the match report limits that you can analyze together, see if you have common information, if you have common origins, if you have common backgrounds that help each other in focusing your uh, genealogy research. The easiest way to find these projects is just to search the internet for them. Something DNA project or um, those are the easiest ways to look for them. There is a search facility that Family Tree DNA offers. You can find it in their website that allows you to find that. If you didn't test with Family Tree DNA, you can still get support from these projects if you contact the administrators. They just can't automatically add your data to their project, so they'll have to help you with some manual analysis. If they have, th these are all volunteers, so if they have the time and the ability to do it, you'll be reliant on their spare time to be able to help you, but at least you'll be able to get some advice from them as to what you should do for that. So just so you have an idea of what to expect when you join these projects, I have some, some examples or some overviews of surname and haplogroup projects that I'll go through here for a little bit. A typical YDNA surname project looks like this. It's a rather complicated chart, but I'll walk you through it. So these are uh, ancient branching lines that descend into modern day that is now a collection of surname project members that have already joined, and this is what you might be joining if you join the project itself. At some point, it, since this is a surname project, the members are mostly, not all, but mostly of the same surname. And at some point, again, this highly varies depending on the origins of your surname, what culture they came from. With Scandinavian countries, it's much more recent. Uh, some countries, it may actually be older, but if I take the standard Western Europe and British Isles approach, it's around 1,000 years ago or so, about 1,000 to 1,200 AD, when surnames first started getting adopted. And if we take these five lines that all started back at a much earlier point together and have branched off from each other, so they're now no longer closely related. Um, my little graphic here says all of these people took a surname at about the same time. These three took a surname that's not the project's surname, that's not the focus of the project. These two took on the project's surname. And of course, a very standard descent line. So the glowing uh, lines represent um, the people who have the surname that the project is interested in. And in the project, you'll see in, in the descendants today, most of the people have the surname. A few lines ended up not having the surname, but they're still in the project. So it's very common, of course, you have a surname that got adopted back at that time frame. 
There are now um, a number of branched descendants who have that surname still. Uh, they're all connected to each other. If you join a project and you end up in that group, you can analyze it compared to your closest matches. Those people may even be closely related to you from a family standpoint. This may push you back earlier than your genealogy, but it will give you some avenues to explore and some ways to connect with people who are of the same surname. Now, there's a couple of ways in which surnames can change. So the two that I have diagrammed here, one is a simple change of surname. So this person over here adopted a surname that's not the one the project is interested in, but sometime afterwards, they changed it. So they, they either migrated or um, the surname uh, was uh, changed into something else. In the Vance surname project, we have a number of people whose original surname was German. It was Wentz. And when they came to English-speaking countries, that became pronounced as Vance, Vance, and it became Vance. So that's maybe that's just an adoption of the same surname and a different pronunciation. You can also see that as a change of surname. And there are people now who descend from that change of surname. It's not that much different from an adoption of the surname. But you have people who started with the surname itself, and at some point they changed the surname to something completely different. But yet they match closely to the Y-DNA of a subgroup that matches the surname. So they've joined the project in an effort to research their name and their connection to that original surname. Now, not all of the people of a different surname will have that connection will have the original surname that the that the project is interested in, but some will. On the other hand, you've got some people who have a different surname today who may have started with that surname, they adopted it themselves, but there was a change of surname to the one that the surname group is interested in. So in this case, I've shown this as what I call an NPE or an MPE, and that's explained down here. It's a, it's a term that we use a lot in Y-DNA research and, in fact, just in general in genetic genealogy to mean a time when a man's surname that he has today is not inherited from his biological ancestry. So at some point, the biological father had a different surname from the son. Uh, that can happen through adoptions. It can happen through infidelities. It can happen through a number of ways that the name can change. Um, and so if that happened in this line, let's say the original man adopted a different surname, at some point there was an adoption into, uh, of this line into someone who had the surname itself, and their descendants end up with the Y-DNA of someone who has that surname as well as the surname itself. But other branches, which carried on and had no adoptions or changes of surname, ended up... Uh, again, closely related to people who are of the surname, so they become part of this group in order to explore that connection a little bit more. Now, there's two types of surname changes that affect the group. There are, in some cases, uh, th here, it's a case of where what we call an NPE, MPE, um, change the surname to the one the group is interested in. So that adds people to the surname itself. It adds people to the surname project. Then there are changes of surname, there's NPEs that take someone out of that surname, or the original line had the surname you're interested in, but the NPE took them out of that surname. So those are the dotted lines, those may still be in the project, they may be in another surname project, but they um, have a connection to the Y-DNA that makes up a part of the surname project, so they're in there as well to explore that connection. So you get a lot of different kinds of people in a surname project. Most of them have a Y-DNA connection to a group that has the surname, and that's why they join. So when you see a list of surname project participants, that's why you often see a lot of the same surname, but sometimes not all of the same surname. Now we switch over to haplogroups. Now to find a haplogroup project is not as straightforward as you might think. Usually, if you have a very specific haplogroup, if your terminal haplogroup has been identified, that's where you end up on a branch at the end of the haplotree. So, for instance, in this example, your haplogroup is BY11131. It's way down here. That's typically going to identify a very small group of people. Yourself, perhaps your closest matches, perhaps your immediate family, um, but not a wide group of people it won't be a target for a haplogroup project, typically. 
uh, a haplogroup project usually has dozens, sometimes hundreds of members, and looks at a haplogroup that's a little more ancient in time, a little farther back. Usually, in fact, not always, but usually before the time of surnames, even. So for that, you have to go exploring a little bit. You won't necessarily know the major haplogroups that have become interesting to people, and these are mostly historical. They're mostly because at some point in the past eight years or so, they were the most recent haplogroup that people knew about, and they formed it because a lot of men were being reported in that haplogroup, and they started to be studied as a group. So in this case, in this example, if you go back in the haplotree, how do you do that? Well, the easiest way is to pull up the haplotree, either find somebody's, e either take Family Tree DNA's version or find someone else's that allows you to look up the haplotree and just do a search on the individual SNPs, which make up the branching points along that way. Uh, you can also go to this website, again, which is the Family Tree DNA's searching function. Um, or you can just search on the, the name of that haplogroup or the name of that SNP with, um, a, with project or DNA project or something like that. If you do this, in this example, you'd find that both L513 and L21 had active haplogroup projects. Now, which one do you join? The answer is both. You want to join as many that are as closely connected to you as possible, but ones where you have a good chance of getting an active uh, project administrator to help assign you to groups and help you explore your connections. In some cases, you'll be in the same group, and you can just do that work once to analyze that subgroup. In some cases, you'll find either a wider group that may help you explore a different time period in your matches, or you'll find other uh, resources, um, even a project admin who may have more time or not, other project members who know something about uh, their own genealogy, but they haven't joined the other project, and so on. So you're maximizing your chances of getting support and information if you join more than one. So that's my sense of how you find haplogroup projects and why you want to join them. Now, the same kind of picture for a haplogroup project. It's not terribly hard to picture, but I wanted to give you the same information that I did for surname projects. In this case, I've made the glowing lines represent just the subgroups of the project the administrator has identified here. They're not necessarily tied to surnames, although they might be. Typically, a haplogroup project will be interested in a group earlier than the time of surnames. Not always. That's not a constant, but it tends to be true. So the surnames are not as important to the haplogroup as the common descent from the same DNA line. Typically, again, uh, not always, but typically they're over two or 3,000 years old. Um, there may be some ancient bones that have been tested that fall into that haplogroup, and the admins will know if that's happened and be able to give you some sense of whether that helps to define the migration patterns or the extent to which that haplogroup had been uh, spread around the, the area of the world that it was found in at that point. But it gives you a number of benefits depending on where you fall in these subgroups. So first of all, they can help you identify the SNPs or the strong STR signature patterns uh, because those can also help you figure out branching. They can identify which of these subgroups are more closely related to each other. So you not only can get help from your own subgroup if you fell into this one, let's say, but you can figure out which other ones are closely related to you, and these become matches that you can analyze for that time frame. Um, so it can give you some benefit in a wider group than you might find in, say, a surname project. Um, you can also find uh, some common groups that are related to each other earlier than the match report. I just drew a line here and said that's the normal limit of a Y-DNA match report that does vary some depending on which report we're talking about. But if you take that as a, as a threshold, some of these subgroups are going to be related before then. So this gives you matches earlier than the times that the match reports can identify. So it gives you more people that match you. They may or may not be in a time frame that you care about, but if they are, then they give you more to analyze. And then, of course, within the subgroups, they can help you understand what the signature patterns are that mark the subgroup, um, that they can help you decide what the right level of testing is for that group. 
if the whole group has tested farther than you have, you may need to upgrade to, to be able to analyze your data fully. Um, but you generally uh, have an ability to connect with people that will help you with your data um, and give you more information than you had uh, by yourself. So let's say you've done this. So you've joined the right groups. You've now got a project subgroup. You may have several project subgroups. You've got a surname project subgroup. You've got a haplogroup project subgroup. You may have a geographical project subgroup. What do you do with those? The answer is goes back to this chart that I drew before. You want to see what helps you break through your genealogical brick walls, what helps add to your genealogy information, what gives you perhaps the ability to name more ancestors or find more related lines, understand how their descent helps you with yours and how you can help with theirs. Um, you, if you collect the genealogy information for the subgroup, you can identify common locations, common uh, patterns of migration perhaps, maybe they moved to an area before your ancestors did and it turns out your ancestors were following there or something, you know, there's lots of information that you can get by, the, by combining genealogy information and understanding um, where their ancestors uh, were showing up in the records compared to yours. You can also develop theories of uh, avenues of further exploration, places where you might find records, priority order for which lines of descent are, are more likely to be related, and so on. If you build mutation histories for these ancestors based on the STR patterns that you have and the SNPs that you have um, and that the rest of the subgroup has as well, you can start to develop your lineages. So this is where you don't have named ancestors, but you have branching that allows you to figure out how those lines are related to each other in a time frame when there's not only no records, but you're never likely to identify the actual names or generations of the ancestors that caused the branching. I showed an example of this at the end of the second video. I won't show it again here, but the idea is that you start to map out the connections that the, that the subgroup shares, and you can push that back even in a time frame where your traditional genealogy research is never going to reach. Now, you can estimate time to common ancestors there. There's different ways of doing that. You can develop theories for how they developed, where they migrated, and so on. And again, that can help to focus your additional research for your genealogy. This is a very powerful thing. My belief is this will become commonplace as an extension of genealogy once we develop Y-DNA and matching databases more fully, and that everyone will have these lineages that connect them with other lines where there's never been a proven ancestor and probably never will be. Now, if you've reached this stage, you're probably also looking for help. Not just help in understanding Y-DNA, but help with the analysis effort, help with identifying matches, help with uh, experience and uh, connections that people have to understand different pieces of the data that you're looking at. So you're reaching out to not only the project administrators, but other uh, members of the subgroups that you have. And of course, there are tools that can also help you with the analysis. Uh, I would suggest you go to this website to find the current tool sets that are recommended for Y-DNA analysis. Uh, there are a number of them. Some help with analyzing STRs. Some, a, a very few help with, under, with understanding SNPs, mostly the SNP information is left up to the haplotree side, which is done by the testing companies. But if you put these together, some of them allow you to do, uh, compare, or al allow you to build trees based on both STRs and SNPs. If you're doing STR analysis, I highly recommend that you do something called a mutation history tree. There are videos, if you search on those, you'll find those, and they're very good at understanding mutation history trees and how to build them. Again, if you choose to do it automatically, there is automation available. There's tool sets for that. But uh, it's good to understand the basics manually first so that you're doing this, um, so that you understand what the automation produces and you can tailor it to your needs. Um, there's other good introductory videos on the basics of, of Y-DNA by John Cleary. These are not the only resources out there. I'll talk about some additional resources just in education at the end of this video. But um, there, from a tool standpoint, there is a lot out there. So if you're going down this path, at some point you're going to want to get the support that's available from various tool sets. Now, 
whether you use tools or not, or you do it all manually, or you already have it all done, and the project administrator can do it all for you, or however you approach this, my belief is you need to integrate all the data that you have. So if you've taken a big Y, for instance, you have both SNP data and SDR data, you want to use them both. If your subgroup has done mostly SDR testing, then you're reliant on STRs. You don't have to ask them to all go upgrade to SNP testing in order to do analysis. You can do a lot of this with only partial data. Clearly, the more data you have, the better. There are sometimes wars and people who give advice between whether SNPs are better than STRs or vice versa. They both have their strengths. They both have their weaknesses. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, although I've touched on some of it. Uh, especially in the second video. My contention is you want to use both if possible. So you want to use the SNP results to provide the overall structure, the connections back into the deep ancestry side, the relationships with other branches that may not be as closely related. The STR results help you build the mutation history tree. They may give you, not always, but they may give you more branching in a genealogical time frame than SNPs can because typically STRs will mutate faster than SNPs. Uh, that's not always true. People's experience does vary because it is statistical and the performance of both in your side of the haplotree will vary from someone else's. But if you put all this together, you can see a picture of n not only the SNP mutation, uh, the STR mutations rather, in this tree, but the SNPs as well. And you put all this together into one view um, the tool, the format doesn't really matter as long as you have a picture that gives you the best uh, example of the branching in your area of the haplotree, in your area that connects the matches that you care about that are within the time frames that help you answer the questions that you have. So that's the, what allows you to build from the, the available data, it allows you to build both the genealogies that help you and the, and the lineage information that can help you learn more about your own lines of descent. Now, one question that I've touched on but not answered fully. Can you estimate the time to a common ancestor? You have some data that shows you have a match. You want to know how far back that match is. So far, you've only looked at genetic distance. Can you use more information to estimate the time back to that ancestor? The short answer is yes. The thing that everyone adds on top of that, which is very valid, is that these are estimates. They're very general. They're not precise. You will not find out that your common ancestor was born in 1672 unless you have genealogy information or records that will tell you that. And the, the Y-DNA clearly points to that ancestor as being the common ancestor. That's unusual. It has happened, but it's very unusual. Generally, you will get an estimate from either SNPs or STRs, because you can do this kind of analysis based on either one. Um, and you will get an estimate that is within maybe 100 to 150 years, you know, plus or minus. So it's got a fairly wide range. And within genealogical times, that's very imprecise. It's not enough to be able to lock in on a specific generation. You may know, for instance, that it's likely to be earlier than your earliest known ancestor, if the estimate comes back in the 1400s and your earliest known ancestor lived in the 1500s or 1600s, but it's not likely to give you enough information to precisely identify the ancestor. Um, the danger with using age estimation techniques in Y-DNA is that you're likely to believe the one that agrees with your expectations. If you think the common ancestor was probably in the 1500s and you get an age estimation that is exactly 1500, you're going to say, ha, it proves it, when the answer is it may just be coincidental or it may just be still an estimate with a wide error range, and that could be 1650, it could be 1350, it's hard to tell when exactly the estimate, uh, how close the estimate really is to the actual date. The thing that makes people's experience vary on this is the mutation rates of both STRs and SNPs compared to the expected rates. So I've drawn this little diagram here to show on the one hand you have STRs and in some people's case they mutate more frequently than usual than expected um, which makes the estimates too old because there's been uh, there's been more change than you would have expected in the time frames. On the other hand you can have people who have 
an experience with STRs that are less frequent than usual, so they haven't changed much. I have one of my subgroups in my Vance surname project whose STRs have hardly changed at all in 400 years, and that's very unusual. And then you have SNPs that may show the same pattern. So SNPs may uh, have mutated more frequently than usual. They may have mutated less frequently than usual. And that pattern or that, that seems to happen uh, independently of STRs. So you end up with these two axes, and only if they're both just right will you find an estimate that agrees if you do an age base, an age estimate based on SNPs and an age um, based on STRs, will they match exactly? Most people typically find that their actual frequencies, and this is just an example, end up being somewhere in this circle but not right in the center. So in this case, this person has SNPs which have mutated more frequently than usual and STRs which have mutated slightly less frequently than usual. So their STR-based estimate will be a little too young, and their SNP-based estimate will be a little too old. And they end up with not having the same estimate if they did them both, and they're not sure which one is correct when the answer is both are off by a certain amount. Now, SNPs are currently the only age estimate that's produced by SNPs uh, is done by a company called Wifel. So you have to submit your data to Wifel to get an estimate that's based on your data. Family Tree DNA is expected to release an age estimate process soon, so by the time you see this video, they may already have theirs. But there's a lot of people out there who can do it by hand as well. You'll get a lot of different advice. People have varying ranges of accuracy on these. So there is some degree of different independent sources of age estimation with SNPs. But again, you have to be careful not to just believe the one that gives you the answer you're looking for. That's my real advice there. With STRs, there are a number of techniques to age estimate, uh, to be able to provide age estimates from STRs. Most of the more sophisticated ones use the individual mutation rates of the markers that are different, as opposed to the mutation rates of uh, the overall set of STRs. The most sophisticated that I'm aware of <clears throat> are by Colin Ferguson's adaptation of key utility, if you search on that, and the SAP tool. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how that's done here. That's more than we have time for. But you can look at these. You can get your age estimates based on those. Uh, for both techniques, more data is better. If you only have two, uh, if you're only comparing two people, it's very hard for that to be a statistically meaningful number. You really have to get to a lot more data before you can count on the age estimates being correct. There are other estimating techniques. They tend to be less precise. So you're getting even a less precise answer of a less precise method in the first place. But you need to understand that typically the error ranges run around 20 to 30 percent. You will find people who, who will give you advice that you should not do one and focus on the other. That either a SNP-based estimation is the only way to go or STR-based estimation is the only way to go. And my sense is that's typically because they have fallen somewhere in this circle that makes them not believe one method or another. If you fall right on the red line down here, for instance, you may be exactly right on SNPs, but it way off on STRs. And your experience will tell you that STRs are not to be used for age estimation, when in reality that's just your uh, example, and other people are going to fall somewhere else in this chart. So uh, I would be careful with advice of people, even me, that tell you there's only one way to do it because um, a lot of it depends on the statistical performance of your mutations compared to everyone else's. So now, I just took you on a journey that took you from uh, the basics of analyzing your matches and the information you got from your test, all the way into the depths of age estimation here, um, and hopefully along the way gave you some actual hints and clues as to how to make progress with your genealogy using the information that you got. And the whole purpose I'm trying to set up is going back to this slide that I was talking about before. So this is, again, my slide that tries to say where I think uh, the use of YDNA for genealogy purposes is headed. Um, I think it will help our genealogies if you talk about genealogies as named ancestors. In that time frame, it's just another tool that you can use like records. 
um, that gives you more information about the biological connections that you have. But hopefully Y-DNA, especially when you connect up with matches and share information, can even help you break through brick walls and find named ancestors that add to your genealogy. It has for many people, and hopefully it will for you as well if you match up with the right folks who have genealogy information. Even if it can't do that, it helps you put together these lineages, the connections between uh, different groups of people that are that go back to common ancestors that have no names and probably never will, but um, allow you to make connections with people and again share information, maybe find common origins and information that don't that probably does not include named ancestors, but may include other information that's meaningful to you. And then again, you've got the deep ancestry, which is interesting to many people as to um, what. Uh, as to where the uh, population of that Y-DNA came from, what the origins are, where it migrated to, etc. And this chart adds that the STRs are typically useful, I'm going to say back about uh, 2,000 years back. Um, that gets into deep ancestry, so it can be useful back that far. It certainly is useful in the time of lineages and genealogies, but it depends on the performance of your STRs, and it also depends on the questions you have. SNPs can be used all the way down to modern day. They tend to mutate less frequently than STRs, so especially within the time frames of genealogy, there are sometimes fewer of them, so you cannot always rely on so you can't always rely on them for the genealogy period. And typically, as I said before, a surname project will focus on the time frames um, after surnames, which can include lineages and genealogies and a haplogroup project will focus on lineages and deep ancestry period. It doesn't usually get into individual surnames, but it can have a subgroup that's mostly with the same surname. So this is the purpose of it. This is where we ended up. This is what I started with in the first video to show you. So I'm wrapping this around to the same point to show you how you get from your Y-DNA test to the subgroup that allows you to do the analysis to build this kind of picture. So just to show you that I'm not making all this stuff up, I'll give you a place to go for examples if you want to see how this works. Now, I'm going to throw the Vance surname project out there. It's not the best example of a surname project out there. I'm not suggesting that it's the, uh, that it's the benchmark or what you should aspire to. I'm just th throwing it out as an example of what I'm talking about. There are plenty of other people. A lot of the common surnames have very in-depth research that's been done. A lot of very good pictures, a lot of very good analysis has been done. Those are equally good examples. Mine is just the one I know best. So if you look on this website, you'll find the results page for the Vance Surname Project. That includes the table that's on the right-hand side here. And the current analysis page, or the current analysis column, rather, has reports for each of our 16 subgroups that includes the deep ancestry, that we know of. It includes the lineage information, how the group is connected. It includes the genealogies, at least at a high level, and it gives some theories uh, where available on the origins of the surname and the group itself within the surname. So it gives you kind of an overview of all the things I'm talking about here. And what I think will end up being perhaps not the same format, perhaps not the same structure of how the reports are broken down and the project is broken down, but what I think will be the same kind of information that eventually will become more widespread and more available for everyone's projects. And with that, I've reached the end of my third video. That's all the material I have. If you'd like, I did include a page of additional resources. I like these two books. Uh, the first one is by Blade Mediger. The second one is a collection of different um, uh, uh, points on genetic genealogy by Debbie Parker Wayne. They both have a lot on autosomal DNA, a little bit on Y DNA, but they're very good introductions and suggestions for further analysis. So if I've made no sense to you at all, these will help. If I've made some sense to you, these will add to that and hopefully give you some more pointers and clues. So I suggest it for both. Over on the right-hand side, there are a number of social media places that I would suggest you start with, especially if you have further questions. These are very active. You'll get a lot of uh, opinions, a lot of information. You'll have to sort through it all, but it's a very good way to get 
uh, started on a path that you may not know where to start, et cetera, or where to find resources that you don't know about. Um, so there's uh, at least two Facebook groups. There are more, but if you start with these, they'll be able to point you to the others. And then there's one on Yahoo Groups, if you prefer that, that uh, interface. Um, there's other online resources. I would suggest these websites. Again, the DNA lecture series has a lot on autosomal and other types of DNA. The ones uh, by John Cleary are focused on Y DNA specifically. And then there are videos by Morris Gleason. Um, he focuses on a lot of other things than mutation history trees, but I particularly like his explanations of those. Um, so that could be very useful for you if you're putting a subgroup together trying to analyze the STRs. And then I do have, if you go back to the results page that I talked about before for the Vance Surname Association, um, that I got some other suggested resources if you want to learn more, if you want more introductory material for YDNA or you want to get some other points of view, there are some other useful links there that you can follow to get more information. So I hope that gives you some places to go beyond this. Uh, but if you've sat through all three videos, thank you very much. If you have or haven't, I hope that it, this has given you some, some hints, some tips, some ways to pursue your genealogy further. Um, and I'll close with just saying best of luck with your genealogy, and I hope that YDNA can help you. Thank you for listening.